This is, I mean, this was a large piece when you can see a, a picture of it, it being returned. This is not something that poor villagers are doing. Poor villagers don't have the capability of looting massive stone statues and entering them into international con commerce. That requires organized crime. It requires armed, you know, armed insurgents, some kind of network to just logistically even get this stuff out of the country. I think it's important to note that this cultural racketeering, much like the illegal trade in arms and guns, it really is a matter of supply and demand. Um, despite the commendable work that the Indian government is doing to combat it, India is in effect a large archaeological site. As long as there's money to be made in it, there are ways to get around any security apparatus you can have. Thank you so much, everyone. I mean, it's, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here, um, not only in India, but here speaking today and to those of you who are online um, to, to talk about what I, I think we'll all agree is a very important subject that is finally starting to get the attention that it deserves. So thank you again for the invitation. It's greatly appreciated um, to be here. So again, my name is Tess Davis. Um, I'm executive director of the Antiquities Coalition, uh, an NGO in the United States that is dedicated to fighting cultural racketeering, that is the looting and trafficking of ancient art, uh, particularly that which funds organized crime, armed insurgency, and, and violent extremism. So. Just to begin, um, last Saturday night in Rampura, there were reports in the Times of India that looters had snuck into the Temple of Ram there and made off with three priceless statues um, into the night. And authorities valued these relics, uh, which were of Hanuman and Sita and Lakshman. They were valued at tens of millions of rupees. Um, but of course, to the people of the temple, to Uttar Pradesh, to the people of India, of course, these are priceless things that cannot be replaced ever. The police have prioritized the case, and they said hope to nab the thieves soon. But the sad reality, um, whether we're talking about the United States, Europe, China here is that most stolen art is never recovered. Um, in fact, there are still hundreds of thousands of artworks that were stolen by the Nazis during World War II that have not been recovered. Um, the statistics are very, very grim. According to this film, which is actually premiering um, this after afternoon at the Arth Festival right around the corner, um, so I encourage all of you to go see it. I believe it's at 5 o'clock today. Um, according to the film, um, there have been some 50,000 artifacts uh, plundered from India in recent decades and centuries. And only 28, the 28 of these have been recovered, all of those to the federal government. And in a number that cannot inspire much faith in the village of Rampura, zero of these have been returned to the temples from which they were stolen. Um, as executive director of the Antiquities Coalition, um, it's been our privilege to work with governments around the world, with the United States government, with the United Nations, and the art market in combating crimes just like this. Um, again, our organization focuses on fighting the looting and trafficking, uh, particularly of ancient art. And again, as I mentioned earlier, particularly that which funds organized crime, armed insurgencies, and, um, and violent extremism. Now, of course, um, as it sounds like the previous talk was discussing, as long as there have been tomb raiders, there, as long as there have been tombs, there have been tomb raiders. And as long as there have been civilizations, there have been enemy armies waiting at the borders to come in and plunder them. But the destruction, the cultural destruction and theft that's taking place in the modern world, um, it's taking place on a scale that's never been seen before in history. And this is because, unlike in history, there's now a multi-billion dollar demand for ancient art. Um, Daesh, ISIS, has gotten a lot of headlines for the looting and trafficking of art from Mesopotamia, but they were by no means the first bad guys to, to fund themselves in this way. Um, 
In fact, dating back to World War II, uh, the Nazis were perhaps the greatest art thieves in history, uh, stealing just countless works from throughout Europe. But even more recently than that, groups like the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, where the bulk of my work has been done, um, the Irish Republican Army, the IRA, um, actually helped to fund some of their violence through art theft. Uh, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, uh, the Al-Nusra Front um, in Syria today. All of these groups are known to loot and traffic um, in art and antiquities. And so because of that, if someone is buying an ancient vase or a bas-relief or a statue on Madison Avenue in New York, they could very well unknowingly be part of a chain that helps, divide, helps to fund some of the, the worst actors in the world today. Um, we created the Antiquities Coalition to fight back against this, and our organization partners with leaders from both the public and the private sector to try to tackle this plunder for profit head on. Um, and again, through that, we work with, with the US government, with foreign governments, and, and with the responsible players in the art market. Um, again, as I've just mentioned, Daesh has been making headlines for this, but they were by no means the first, and they won't be the last, as long as there is a profit to be made by stealing and selling ancient history, people will be doing it. Um, again, the Nazis, the Khmer Rouge, Al-Qaeda, the IRA, the Taliban, the Haqqani network um, in Afghanistan and Pakistan, there are credible reports of all of these groups looting and trafficking in antiquities. Um, but Daesh has been perhaps the most famous um, just because they, it happened at such a scale it became unavoidable. So I'll just talk briefly a little bit about that. Uh, reports emerged in around, I guess that was 2014, that um, they were looting at least one of, the, one of the cradles of civilization to fund and arm their cause. And of course this went on with rampant extortion that was taking place um, of the local community, uh, the illicit trade in guns and other resources, like um, you probably saw headlines about the rampant oil trade that ISIS was doing. And it was confirmed um, by the United Nations Security Council in a um, binding and unanimous resolution in 2015, in which the Security Council warned that Daesh and Al-Qaeda and the Al-Nusra Front um, again, we're looting and trafficking antiquities to arm their cause. And this is in addition to, to just the rampant cultural destruction that was taking place otherwise. Um, you may have seen the footage of the explosions at Palmyra or Nimrud, but notice those are all things that are too big to sell. Um, and reports from those on the ground warn that before those buildings were destroyed, they were completely plundered of their, their contents. Um, this, re this resolution, the Security Council resolution, put this trafficking on par with that taking place from oil and ransoms and furthermore ordered all member states and the United Nations to take appropriate action to stop this trade immediately. Um, not too long after that, in August of 2016, um, the United States Federal Bureau of Investigation, our FBI, likewise announced that it had received, quote, credible evidence that Daesh looted antiquities were being sent to the United States, um, that they were headed to the U.S. market. Now, a leader of a group called the International Association of Dealers in Ancient Art um, said publicly, he, quote, stringently denied um, that there was any such risk saying, and I quote, nobody on the market would touch this stuff with a 10-foot barge pole. Um, the ma majority of auction houses also dismissed this warning and other concerns, um, saying, and this is a quote uh, from, from one of the two top auction houses, we are always on the alert for material of this type in case an attempt is made to introduce looted items into the commercial art market, and we work closely with UNESCO with Interpol and other entities to ensure that any such attempts will be caught. Likewise, James Cuno, um, who is president and CEO of one of America's top museums, um, the Getty, and he had been at a number, another of our top museums before that, the Met, 
um, said, quote, no responsible museum is buying anything that might ha possibly have come from Iraq or Syria. Uh, the overarching message of this, of these comments, um, again, in response to this warning from the FBI, was that due to the art market's own ethics and its own ethical standards and self-regulation, that there was no demand in the United States for the so-called blood antiquities. Or, or was there? So again, this was 2015 when all these comments were made. Then, um, not too long after, in early 2016, the art world had gathered in New York for one of its biggest annual events. Uh, which is called Asia Week. Uh, there's a big one in New York every year and a big one in London every year. And this, the New York one is a 10-day celebration of Asian culture. And in 2016, it brought together 46 of the world's leading dealers in Asian art, five auction houses, and over a dozen museums and other cultural institutions to exhibit, buy, and sell masterpieces from Afghanistan to Japan and everywhere in between. Um, however, in, in 2016, um, these industry leaders were soon joined by uninvited guests. Um, at the start of the festivities, uh, federal agents stormed Asia Week and from then on conducted near daily seizures of looted art. Did, did these make the headlines here at all? Okay. No, no. Um, these raids were part of a crackdown by the Manhattan District Attorney, um, who's the lead prosecutor for, in the state government in New York, we're a federal system too, um, in Homeland Security investigations. And their investigation continues to this day, but um, to date they have confiscated millions, in fact I would say hundreds of millions of dollars um, of ancient art from India as well as global hotspots and conflict zones, um, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and post-conflict countries like Cambodia. One antiquities dealer um, has been convicted of criminal possession of stolen property, um, and another, Nancy Weiner, um, who was even more prominent, in fact, I think she was arguably um, the top Asian art dealer in the United States at the time is now facing felony charges. Uh, still another, whose name may be more familiar to you, Subhash Kapoor, um, is now awaiting extradition to the United States from India. Um, he's now facing uh, trial in Tamil Nadu for antiquities looting and smuggling there. Um, and he is an American citizen, so after he finishes that trial, he'll be back um, to New York. So. Um, this, these raids uh, prompted warnings that the illicit, the American market in Asian art was, was the wild, wild east of the art world. Um, indeed, I'll be the first to say that in recent years, the art world has done much to clean up its act, um, especially in regards to antiquities from, I'd say, from Greece and Italy for classical pieces. Um, in response to immense pressure from those countries and their national governments. Um, but while we have, on the one hand, um, art market leaders saying that they would never, ever, ever deal with looted art from Iraq and Syria and dismissing any concerns from either the U.S. government, the FBI, or advocacy groups that this type of trade is happening and we should be aware of it, at the same time, they were actively trafficking at the highest levels of the art market. You don't get any more premier than these people um, with art that had been looted, in some cases quite recently, from war zones uh, further east, from post-conflict countries, um, and again for countries like India. And again, these treasures weren't being sold online or hawked in dark alleyways secretly. Um, they were going to the top collectors, and the United States and indeed the world. People come from all over the world for this festival. Um, they were going to their top museums. Um, again, you cannot have a higher class event than this. Now over the last century, but especially the last several decades, there has been a growing awareness of the vast scale and the serious consequences um, of antiquities looting and trafficking. 
And this has been evidenced by a series of increasingly stronger art market codes um, by international conventions like the 1970 UNESCO convention. Um, and again, even the UN Security Council um, is taking on this issue, which would have been, I think, unthinkable even, you know, 10 years, 15 years ago, um, at least before the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Um, However, despite this increased awareness, um, scholars like Neil Brody, who's arguably the world's top expert in antiquities, looting, and trafficking, has been saying for about the past 15 years that Asian collections just have not figured into this debate. That while the art market has been working to clean up its act when it comes to, again, Greek and Roman pieces, even some pieces from Turkey, there's rampant reports of looting throughout Asia. And yet again, nothing's really been done um, about this. And they found that Neil Brody and his colleague um, found that this lack of discussion was in contrast to rising numbers of Asian collections um, in the United States and beyond which again seemed to show that there was a huge American market for this material. Um, the American market for Asian art, as you see from this graph here, has grown very steadily um, over the last century. It started, according to those who have researched it, with an interest in Chinese and Japanese art, um, particularly decorative arts and things like prints and works on paper. And it was just over the century that a taste for older, more archaeological pieces um, started to develop. But there was still no real demand for anything that wasn't Chinese or Japanese as late as the World World II period. Um, however, the communist takeover of China in 1949 um, led to a breakdown of trade between the US and China. And starting with that period, they found that there was increasingly a market in the United States for South and Southeast Asian material. Um, then the opening of the Chinese market again in the 1980s led to even more interest in um, art from the entire region. And again, even in the 1980s and 90s, there started to be a number of headlined scandals in the U.S. Um, for series with art and in antiquities, stolen material, be that from material that was looted by the Nazis or even, even some antiquities. Um, but even while all of this is going on, while the Getty, one of their curators, is, um, is charged by Italian authorities with looting and trafficking, which was a huge scandal in the museum community, museums in the United States continue to take in questions, um, sorry, pieces from Asia with no questions asked. Um, and I can certainly say this with regards to Cambodian material, which is the material I know the most about. I lived there for years, have worked very closely with the Cambodian government. And even as reports were on the front page of Phnom Penh falling, of genocide going on in the country, you had very prominent museums in the United States, um, especially since we didn't have older institutions like the ones in Europe, taking in Cambodian pieces, clearly hacked off from temples. I've spoken to some people who were working at museums at the time who said some would even come in with dirt on them. Um, so a hugely different reaction to that which we're seeing today from the stuff coming out of I Iraq and Syria. In fact, this double standard was noted um, in a 2008 op-ed um, in the New York Times by, by their art critic. And he said, he was lamenting the eager market in the US for what he called art casualties from Tibet to Cambodia, pondering, how is it that so few questions are asked about just how works of art of major importance, for which no government would ever issue an export license, come to tumble onto the market? Do the temples of Cambodia erected by the Khmers at the height of their culture between the 10th and the 13th centuries ring so few bells? And he concluded that from Tibet to Cambodia, the common treasure of mankind is being squandered at a rate that matches the melting of Antarctica. And yet business goes on. 
for the next few years, business, those words did ring true and, and business indeed did go on as usual, at least until February 2012. Um, then in a front page story, the New York Times exposed that the highlight of that year's Asia Week sale um, had been looted from a Cambodian temple and the chaos leading up to the killing fields. And the newspaper illustrated its report with a photograph of this uh, $3 million, $3 million so-called mythic warrior on the glossy cover of Sotheby's catalog. It was the cover girl, so to speak. And then another picture inside the paper showed the feet and the pedestal still in situ at the um, 10th century ruins of Kokher um, in the northwestern Cambodian jungles. Has anyone been to Cambodia and seen Angkor or any of these temples? Um, this one's pretty remote. It's, it's, the road there is better these days. But um, so to go back, you can see how they very stylistically and, and beautifully blurred the image out at the bottom of the feet um, so you don't notice the fact that the feet are missing. Um, it was hacked off again at the ankles. This led uh, lawyer Herbert Larson of Tulane um, University to tell the Times every red flag on the planet should have gone off when this was offered for sale. It screams loot. In April, um, at Cambodia's request, the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, and that's the federal jurisdiction that includes Manhattan, filed a civil forfeiture action against Sotheby's seeking to seize and return the statue to Cambodia. And quoting internal emails, um, which is the continuing lesson we always learn from lawsuits, be careful about what you put in writing. Um, the complaint, this complaint revealed that the auction house's own expert, whom they had hired to appraise the piece, had warned them that it was, quote, definitely stolen, and suggested that the owners might, quote, want to offer it back to the National Museum of Cambodia to save everyone some embarrassment. However, upon finding that the Kingdom of Cambodia's policies were at the time focused on preventing future looting, which is always an uphill battle, um, and that there were no plans at the moment to ask for the return of anything, Sotheby's felt it could safely proceed with the sale. And its internal correspondence shows that it was prepared for quote, bad press from temple huggers, um, but clearly not any greater consequences. Um, it was later revealed um, through research by the Cambodian government, um, by actually French experts who were assisting the case, and the US prosecutors, that not only was the statue stolen property, that it had been uh, stolen from the country in the chaos leading up to the killing fields during the Civil War, from an area that was occupied by the Khmer Rouge. Um, and of course, the Khmer Rouge are the group that eventually took control of Cambodia um, in 1975, which, by the way, is the same year the statue appeared on the international market in Europe, um, and were responsible for the deaths of a quarter of the population in around four years. Um, so this statue showed up basically just as Phnom Penh was falling, missing its feet. It was actually in pieces. It had been broken down to make it easier to smuggle out um, and was bought, I'm not making this up, by Belgian royalty. Um, clearly, they had newspapers in Belgium. And again, how, how would this piece have entered the market legally? Um, it was later revealed um, with the help of research by archeologists as well as um, top journalists from the New York Times and the LA Times, that this statue was just one of a number of statues that was stolen not only from the same temple, but the same sanctuary. And that picture, there's no scale there, but it's, a, it's smaller than this room. Um, and they had been all, you'll recognize this looks identical to an Indian temple. Um, the statues had all been there. You would have the Sotheby's one fighting another one. Let's see, is there a pointer on this? These two had been like, kind of like a comic book brought to life, really, fighting in the middle of the temple. And then you would have Pandava brothers um, watching them. Hanuman was there. They were all 
around all of these pieces showed up on um, on the international market and the scene is recreating once this was figured out again Sotheby's had called this piece a um a mythic warrior it was later learned that it was Duryodhana uh, fighting Bhima once they were able to figure out um, who all of these these statues were so again we're talking about the same temple stolen at the same time probably by the same people who if they weren't directly the Khmer Rouge definitely had their full support I mean nothing happened in Khmer Rouge territory that was not benefiting the Khmer Rouge all ending up on the market and again do these disappear into dark alleys or private collections no, we have the Denver Art Museum, the Cleveland Art Museum, Sotheby's New York, the Norton Simon Museum in California, which has a big Indian collection as well, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, they all show that literally from one coast of the United States to the other and in between all of these statues made it onto the so-called legitimate market. Um, and of course, once learning this, Cambodia rapidly called for their repatriation as well. And in doing so, this launched an international and also ongoing effort to bring home these statues, particularly those that were stolen during the war. Cambodia is really focused on the ones that were the so-called blood antiquities or conflict antiquities. And the kingdom has had a great deal of success. Um, it had its first success in June of 2013 when the Metropolitan Museum of Art um, returned two statues to Phnom Penh. And according to the, according to the Met, it said that it was willing to do this voluntarily when Cambodia came to them with dispositive evidences that these were stolen property. Um, however, despite the Met's return, um, Sotheby's continued to hold firm to its position, countering in public that the Met's voluntary agreement does not shed any light on the key issues in our case, and we expect to prevail. Um, so all of this is happening in and here you see um, some of the repatriations that were, were major deals that were held in the equivalent of the Cambodian White House. Uh, the Prime Minister attended one of them, the Deputy Prime Minister, who took a real, real interest in this case and showed a lot of leadership in it, as did uh, the Secretary of State, His Excellency Chan Tani. Um, they, were, they were really national affairs and I think showed how important this is. Um, so Cambodia was able to recover these pieces eventually. Um, we don't know exactly what made Sotheby's fold, but um, the timing was interesting because when all the procedural legal work was done and the quick case would have been headed to trial, they suddenly decide to give the, the statue back um, while still denying that they had to legally. Um, it was returned to Cambodia. It was also returned um, alongside a piece from Christie's Auction House that Christie's, to their credit, um, had sold years earlier. And I think it's very unlikely that anyone would have made the connection. And Christie's came forward and said, we believe this is part of the same temple. We would like to return it. Um, as well as the piece from the, from the Nord and Simon Museum all went back um, to a great amount of, of fanfare. And so this is all happening in the backdrop. And you think but this type of press, it was on the front page of the New York Times, I want to say three or four times. Um, it was on a number of other papers. It was on NPR. It gained a great amount of attention and really shone a spotlight on the trade um, in Asian antiquities and the fact that some stolen property was definitely getting through. However, despite this happening, sales at Asia Week uh, continued continued to climb. Um, the art market, except perhaps for the sector dealing specifically with Cambodian pieces, it did seem like there were, weren't a lot of Cambodian pieces on the market during this time, um, continued not only as it was, but as you see the, the Asia Week sales continued to grow. I mean, those are huge, huge amounts of money that we're talking about. You know, look at all this money that's still being spent on Asian art while this is continuing. And given these, whoops, giving these rising numbers, um, I mean, look at that. The art market had very high hopes for Asia Week in 2016. Um, in the words of its chairman, for connoisseurs and collectors who want to immerse themselves fully in the wonders of the Far East, they know that there is a once a year celebration that they must attend. And it is no wonder, Asia Week combines top 
flight galleries and world-renowned art specialist for over a week of outstanding events and ex exhibitions, all sprinkled around the world's most exhilarating city of New York. Um, Perhaps this type of exhilaration was not what they were prepared for. Again, at the start of festivities, uh, federal agents, Storm Christie's, seizing two Indian sculptures that you see here that were valued to close to, I think they were valued around half a million dollars each. And the raids were part of um, an operation called Operation Hidden Idol. Um, which was a joint investigation between the Manhattan District Attorney's Office um, and Homeland Security Investigations, um, which a lot of people are surprised to hear that Homeland Security deals with art theft, but they deal with any crime dealing with U.S. borders um, and have a, very, uh, have a small but very dedicated team on this issue. Um, with assistance from both uh, Interpol and the Indian law enforcement, and Operation Hidden Idol uh, was specifically targeting the trafficking network of Subhash Kapoor. And I know there have been lectures on him here in the past, including by Vijay Kumar, who's, I'd say, arguably the world's expert um, on Kapoor. And so I will direct you to his book for more information on that. But um, for now, it suffices to say that he was a leading American Indian art dealer um, who was then, and again still is, um, awaiting extradition to New York. The raids began at Christie's in Asian Week, but they didn't end there. Um, according to the New York Times, in the end, um, Homeland Security and the Manhattan DA seized eight masterpieces worth millions of dollars um, from several prominent dealers. Again, these weren't small-time people. Um, they actually arrested a Japanese antiquities dealer who later pled guilty to criminal possession. Um, for a second century sculpture of um, the Budapetta, the Buddhist footprints, which you see here, which had been looted from Pakistan's Swat Valley. Um, and again, think of the Swat Valley and the things that are happening there, and who would have the capability, and this is, I mean, this was a large piece when you can see a, a picture of it, it being returned. This is not something that poor villagers are doing. Poor villagers don't have the capability of looting massive stone statues and entering them into international con commerce. That requires organized crime. It requires armed, you know, armed insurgents, some kind of network to just logistically even get this stuff out of the country. Um, he wasn't the only dealer implicated. Agents seized a million dollar piece from the um, Upper East Side Gallery of Nancy Weiner, along with thousands of documents and emails. Um, and as the New York Times noted, um, Nancy Weiner and her mother Doris, who passed away around 2011, um, were really legendary among New, New York's art dealers. Um, again, Nancy uh, Weiner was second generation. Her mother had been uh, actually a prominent dealer in Cambodian art as well, I mean, dating back to, I want to say, the 60s, um, but at least the 70s. And they're credited with really helping to kick off the market in Indian and other Asian works, um, and they sold to, told to the Rockefellers, um, they stole to, sold to Stravinsky, to Jackie O, um, Jackie Kennedy at the time, um, and others for half a century. These were very prominent people. And so, oh, there you can see how big, how big that piece was. Um, that's, the, that's the district attorney in New York, so who's the, in charge of prosecuting cases um, for the state government. So investigators and prosecutors um, in New York, at least, have clearly begun to recognize that antiquities looting and trafficking is not a white-collar victimless crime. It might end up as a white-collar crime, but it doesn't start that way. And Cyrus Vance, who you see in the picture there, Cyrus Vance Jr., um, he warned that their work was going to continue. He said every year fine art collectors from around the world flocked to New York for Asia Week, where they spent a reported $360 million last year um, on Asian antiquities and art. With high demand from all corners of the globe, collectors must be certain of provenance. And that basically means a piece's ownership history. It's like a pedigree uh, before purchasing. And I urge dealers and auction houses to take every necessary precaution to avoid facilitating the sale of cultural heritage stolen from other civilizations. If the provenance is in doubt, report it to law enforcement. Finally, in response to that, there was some financial correlation 
um, to this. And Asia Week sales dropped significantly. It, it took a law enforcement raid a day, but it happened. Um, and this caused, this caused an estimated loss of $230 million probably because of these raids. Not to count um, the money lost on the relinquished antiquities themselves and, and legal fees, which in New York can be, especially New York lawyers, can be quite extensive. Um, but there was more to come. Um, again, I mentioned when they went into Nancy Weiner's gallery, they made off with you know, some computers and paperwork. And months later, in December of that year, uh, the Manhattan DA charged Weiner with criminal possession of stolen property and the first and second degrees, which are pretty serious crimes, or can be, while teasing further uh, charges of her alleged co-conspirators. And the complaint revealed a global um, smuggling network that was reaching from the jungles of Southeast Asia, um, through Afghanistan, all the way to, again, Madison Avenue in New York. And it also provided additional information on some of the masterpieces that had traveled through this underground route. And these included bronze and stone statues in the round, but also architectural elements and bas-reliefs um, ranging in age from the first to the 12th century. They had been hacked off of temples or dug up from ruins in India, but also Afghanistan, Pakistan, Cambodia, um, possibly Tibet and Thailand. Uh, they're still trying to sort out. It's hard sometimes to see where these pieces are from when ancient civilizations crossed modern borders. And then they have been trafficked through the ports of Bangkok, Hong Kong, and Singapore. And despite their illegal origins, um, several had gone on to auction at the top auction houses in Manhattan. And at the time of writing, she is still awaiting trial herself. Um, and the Manhattan DA describes this as a continuing criminal investigation um, and says that additional charges may follow. Um, hopefully, this has spurred the art world into doing what is necessary to prevent a repeat. Um, and I think it's important to note that this cultural racketeering, much like the illegal trade in arms and guns, it really is a matter of supply and demand. Um, despite the commendable work that the Indian government is doing to combat it, India is in effect a large archaeological site. There are, I was just at the National Museum and saw pieces that looked brand new that were 5,000 years old. I'm sure if you dig anywhere here, you're going to find you know, there's history there. Um, likewise, the United States as well has a rampant looting and trafficking problem. There are estimates that 95% of Native American sites have been looted. Um, it's just not possible to police every ancient site in the world all of the time. Um, I've had a lot of conversations with Cambodian traffickers and looters about what is necessary to combat this trade, and they all have always had the same answer, that as long as there's money to be made in it, there are ways to get around any security apparatus you can have. Um, and indeed, it's true whether you're talking about guns or drugs or the wildlife trade, there's never been an illicit trade in history that has been defeated from the source end. It just doesn't happen. They can only be defeated from the demand end. Um, and for now, though China is rapidly catching up, um, the United States leads world demand for all types of art, including antiquities. 42% um, of the world market is in the United States. And I think probably a huge, huge, huge percentage of that is in New York City. Um, research by our organization, the Antiquities Coalition, just to kind of put into scale um, what material might be coming from India to the United States, has shown that a shocking 710 million, nearly 711 million um, dollars worth of Indian art and antiquities has entered the United States as declared imports in the last 10 years. And you see with the exception of that first year, it'd be interesting to know uh, the economic crash probably that happened in the United States and elsewhere in 2008. But other than that, there's been a steady rise. Um, now, Glenn, these are declared imports. This is at least on the surface, the legal trade, but it gives us an idea of what the illicit trade may be. And we all know there's every reason to undervalue and not declare things when you're going into everywhere that have even have nothing to do with trafficking, just in terms of how much tax you pay and things like that. Um, that means that this is probably just the, the tip of the iceberg. 
711 million dollars um, which again is probably just the tip of the iceberg so in short by cutting off the market into the united states since we are 42 43 percent of the global market you can deal an effective blow against the entire global market you can really half demand um, and one way to do this is through a bilateral agreement which is also called a memorandum of understanding um, and this is like one the United States signed with Libya about almost a year ago to the day today, a couple of weeks from now, and will be the one year anniversary of this. And these MOUs, as they're called, basically what they do is they restrict the, um, oops, sorry, they restrict the import of illicit, well, let's say undocumented cultural property into the United States. So they shouldn't affect the legal trade. If you have an export permit, if you have proof that a piece left the country, whether that country is Libya or China or Cambodia or India, legally, you can still bring it in. But if you don't have proof, the piece is kind of guilty until proven innocent. Um, and it can't come into the country. It closes off that U.S. market. And to date, the United States has signed agreements with 17 countries, um, including such powerhouses, especially cultural powerhouses as China, um, Italy and Egypt. And these MOUs really benefit all parties. Um, again, because the U.S. market is so large, by closing the U.S. market to illicit material, um, you can have an effect against the entire global black market given that we're the leading demand for stolen art in the world. Um, it also serves the U.S. policy goals of cutting off crime at our borders. It's a lot easier to stop this material before it comes into the country than to have prosecutions and law enforcement investigations later. Those take a lot of resources. Um, and repatriation takes a lot of resources as well. It's not cheap. There's insurance, there's storage fees, there's shipping fees. Um, and it also, again, um, hopefully will eventually start leading to a lower demand that will eventually trickle down and protect archaeological sites. And these MOUs have had a lot of success. Um, for example, after the United States um, implemented import restrictions on Cambodian material, um, sales of Khmer art at auction dropped by some 80% and never recovered. Now, of course, maybe this material is just going underground, but still that still does seem to show that there is at least an increased awareness um, of what's going on and that a dent is beginning to be made in the market. But more often, on the flip side of this, these uh, agreements also lead to responsible cultural exchange. Um, so they facilitate traveling museum exhibitions, um, and they help to lead to some major um, traveling exhibitions from the National Museum of Cambodia to the United States, which allowed the American public to see Cambodian art, but in a responsible way that benefited Cambodia. Um, and of course, we, the sharing of art is a wonderful thing. I'm sure when people went into that exhibit, people who never thought of going to Cambodia were suddenly like, oh, I should go to Cambodia. This would be amazing to see. And it leads to tourism and increased understanding. But it needs to be in a way that benefits the countries whose art it actually is and not just stealing it from them. Um, I mean, that statue, again, the, the statue that was returned to Cambodia, that was a $3 million statue. The National Museum of Cambodia could do a lot of wonderful things with $3 million. It could go a long way. And um, certainly in today's world, um, there's a need for more cultural exchange. And, um, and I think, too, just between India and the United States and what's happening um, just around the world, the threats we see to democracy. Uh, worldwide that the more cultural exchange that can happen between the world's two largest democracies would be a, a wonderful thing um, and a wonderful thing to expose um, the American public to more of India's rich heritage in a way that doesn't involve stealing it and keeping it. Um, so here you see the agreements around the world and they're, they're kind of scattered but there's a, there's a growing number. Um, I encourage everyone, if you're interested in this, to pick up um, The Idol Thief by, by Vijay Kumar. It's an amazing read, um, and Vijay is a true hero who has just brought an amazing amount of um, knowledge to the trade and Indian art in particular, but he also works in combating trade from 
anywhere that he encounters it. He's a, he has a day job as a, as a trade expert, and his hobby is to track down looted pieces online. And he's made some amazing um, discoveries and has really been critical to a lot of the law enforcement work um, that's going on in the US on this subject now. And you can pick up his book at, um, is it Basri Sons at Con Market? I got it there yesterday myself. Um, and again, if you're interested in this topic too, there's a documentary premiering today um, called Blood Buddhas, which is looking at the trade, particularly in art from here and from Pakistan um, and Sri Lanka. Um, that'll be premiering today right down the street. Um, and I encourage you to do that as well because it's a topic with a lot of, a lot of potential in it. Um, and so, yeah, thank you for your time today. Again, our organization, um, we, we work basically to close the U.S. market to this material. And encourage you to, to learn more about our work at our website. It's theantiquitiescoalition.org or to follow us online at um, Twitter or at Combat Looting because um, it is a global problem. It's affecting every country in the world, the United States as well. We're losing a lot of our history to the market, particularly in Europe. There's a big interest in Native American art. Um, and it's really going to involve closing more awareness um, at all levels, both to keep people from buying this material, but also in telling our elected leaders, whether here or in the United States as well, a lot of what we try to do is to get across that this isn't just, and I say just lightly because I'm trained in archaeology, so I do care about the history of these things, but it's not just a matter of preservation. This, is, this illicit trade is not only stealing history, it's funding, very, it's funding violence around the world, and it's, it's having real economic and financial damage on the communities um, from which these pieces are taken. So happy to answer any questions, and um, yeah, thank you again for your time.